the National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine, A Women's Journey, thank you for joining this evening's webcast, COVID-19, A Child's Perspective. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well-being through health education, and we encourage you to visit hopkinsmedicine.org for updated information about COVID-19 from Johns Hopkins infectious disease specialists and other experts. You can also visit A Women's Journey to learn about its timely podcast, videos, and educational programs. Tonight's speakers are pediatrician Rachel Thornton, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, and pediatric psychiatrist Hal Kronsberg, Instructor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Together, they will address COVID-19, health and psychological issues confronting children zero to 12 and their parents. Following the remarks, Dr. Thornton and Kronsberg will respond to many of your questions. Please use the Q&A icon found on the bottom of your screen to ask a question. At the conclusion of tonight's webcast, which will be around 8 p.m., you'll receive an email asking you to complete a five question survey about this webcast and offer suggestions of additional webcasts that you would find informative. And now I'm pleased to welcome Drs. Thornton and Kronsberg. Good evening. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Rachel Thornton. Um, I wanted to open up our, our conversation this evening with a little bit of general information for parents and caregivers of children regarding COVID-19, the symptoms that generally we believe are associated with infection, what we know about severity of COVID-19 in children, and uh, several other considerations that are incredibly important in the care of children now and, and always. First of all, uh, for all the parents out there, uh, in general, our understanding is that COVID-19 tends to present as a flu-like illness in most children. Uh, compared to what we know about adults, it seems for the most part that COVID-19 symptoms are generally less severe in children and generally um, generally pr present um, less complications. That being said, children can also have significant uh, complications from COVID-19. It's, it's just generally less frequent of an occurrence. So what are the symptoms of COVID-19 that parents may want to look for in their children? And what should you do if you think your child is ill with COVID-19? We know that Similar to adults, some of the most common symptoms are cough, fever, um, and shortness of breath can be less common, but is also one of the frequently presenting symptoms. Though so compared to adults, where these symptoms are present about 90% of cases, um, based on recent reports from the CDC. In children, we think it's about 70% of those who've tested positive in the United States have cough, fever, and shortness of breath. Other types of symptoms to keep in mind, things that we screen for or might ask you about if you call your pediatrician's office, are sore throat, muscle aches or myalgias, headache and diarrhea, which also can be presenting symptoms for children who have COVID-19. Sometimes children will have mild symptoms that a caregiver might not identify as COVID-19, and there have been some documented cases of children who have no symptoms at all with the infection. So we're learning a lot, and uh, there are many unanswered questions, and this is rapidly changing. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention continue to provide updated information as it becomes available on how COVID-19 is experienced by children and people of all ages in the United States. So if you're worried that your child has symptoms that could be COVID-19, what should you do? In general, pediatricians recommend that you start by calling your primary care provider, but if the symptoms seem emergent or urgent, we would recommend that you seek medical care. So how do you tell the difference? Like I said, cough, fever, shortness of breath, 
sometimes diarrhea or headache are ways that this infection can present. Um, but when your child is having respiratory distress, so this we would characterize as difficulty breathing, turning blue around the lips, unable to catch their breath, those are more severe symptoms that should warrant immediate medical attention. I think a lot of people also wonder about the difference in symptoms between younger children and infants and older children. Uh, what we know so far, as, I've, as I understand it from having uh, looked at some of the more recent reports from the Centers for Disease Control and what we're learning from the infectious disease experts at Johns Hopkins, who are helping us to understand how to screen and manage COVID-19 in children, is that it is possible that infants may present with more severe symptoms than older children, but youth are also at risk of symptoms um, and may require hospitalization. So I think it's really, depending on the age of your child, uh, you wanna be cognizant and aware of when they're really not acting like themselves. Um, and though that's a time to call the pediatrician if your child has a fever or a cough and you're really concerned about it or you want more information to know what you should be looking for, call them early and start a conversation. But like I said, any signs that suggest a child is really having trouble breathing, that requires urgent attention and you should seek medical attention in an emergency department or an urgent care center in, in short order for that. And then also with the diarrhea, and um, other symptoms that can sometimes come with fever or with, uh, we, we want to make sure kids are well hydrated. And hydration is a particularly sensitive issue for infants and young children. So we oftentimes recommend parents keep track of whether their child's making wet diapers the way they normally do, whether they're producing tears. All of these things are important things to keep in mind. And, and just to emphasize again, pediatricians, take great pride in being advocates for children, in listening to and honoring parents' concerns about their children. And so I would encourage you to start that dialogue with your primary care pediatrician. There's a lot of conversation out there about what's happening in community pediatric practices or really just the practice of medicine in general. Are doctor's offices still open? Are they here to see patients? What do I do if I need my doctor? Um, can I come into the office? And I will tell you, as always, pediatricians are here for their patients. And in our community, I know what's happening in Maryland better than anywhere. Uh, but we take very seriously the obligation we have to patients and families. And there are other things we're doing every day that are essential medical services and critically important. This includes prioritizing vaccination of infants and young children. The, Maryland, the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics has continued to recommend and advocate that pediatricians prioritize and that everyone consider essential visits that are um, part of our normal preventive health for children where we vaccinate them. And those are the two month, four month, six month, any time between zero and two years. There's a series of vaccines that are really critical for keeping children protected against other illnesses that can cause them significant um, illness and disease. We're also prioritizing the four-year-old visit where we do a variety of essential vaccinations. Uh, in addition to this, when mothers are discharged from the hospital after giving birth, babies are still being born now, we're here to make sure that those babies are growing as they should when they first get home to their mothers. Um, many offices are doing visits electronically or remotely um, and doing everything within their power to ensure that the healthy children who need vaccinations, who need weight checks, can come to their office at a time that's separate from any time where they might be taking care of children with other illnesses. We're also prioritizing giving ongoing care to children who have chronic diseases. In many cases, we can do that remotely by checking in by video or phone, and practices have adapted quickly to doing this. Um, the other thing I just wanna call out, because this often comes up with a lot of things in the care of children is, how do we talk to children about complicated topics where there's uncertainty, 
topics that even we as adults may have questions or um, worries about. I would encourage people who are caregivers of children who are looking for age appropriate resources to check out the um, the Maryland, the excuse me, the American Academy of Pediatrics website, healthychildren.org. It always has amazing information for parents, but they have a whole section on age appropriate information for talking to children of different developmental stages about COVID-19 and a variety of things for parents to keep in mind. Um, I would just say that in general, I'm a big proponent of honest, open, developmentally appropriate communication with children. They never cease to amaze me at what they're taking in and observing in their world. Um, and in these unprecedented times, uh, I think that all children are aware that things aren't quite the way they normally are for them, that their routines have changed, that uh, life around their homes is different. And I, I would really encourage parents and other caregivers to engage children in a conversation about what they know and um, what they're feeling in these times. Um, it's really empowering to children to be able to share their, their wealth of, of knowledge and skill and understanding of the world with the adults in their lives. And it's also really empowering to them to know that some of the things they're doing right now are helping in the fight against the spread of COVID-19. I think most school-aged children out there are familiar with things like hand sanitizer and coughing in your elbow because these are the kind of things that in normal times their teachers are reinforcing as important practices to prevent the spread of the flu of, and of other uh, infectious uh, illnesses that may, may be more prominent in winter time. And practicing these things at home are, are good skills for children to continue to reinforce. It's also uh, helpful for them to understand why we're keeping our distance from one another um, and that that's a way of, of preventing the spread of coronavirus. And I will also say that I think that I was just on healthychildren.org today. I know that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have recently recommended that we uh, have recently made some recommendations around masking. I think parents may have a lot of questions and children may have a lot of questions about why people are wearing masks and parents may have a lot of questions about when their children should wear masks. Um, and, and there's great information and guidance on the American Academy of Pediatrics website about this and I'd be happy uh, to talk about this further if, if this is something that is of interest to folks in the question and answer. And the final thing I want to say for, for caregivers and parents of children out there is that pediatricians um, and the other practitioners and clinicians who take care of children, I believe all of us really value our partnership with parents. Um, and we understand that this is a stressful and difficult and challenging time for everyone. And I think it is incredibly important uh, that we open up those conversations with parents so that, and other caregivers so that, uh, so that you know that it is safe, it is appropriate, it is welcomed for you to bring forth any concerns that you have about the stress of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the response that different uh, governmental organizations and others are implementing to keep us safe, how, that, how that's affecting you. Um, we really want to know. We want to support you. Uh, we, we have a critical role to play, for example, for new mothers and new parents in screening new mothers for things like postpartum depression in the year after birth of their child. And we understand that the health of the child depends on the health and the well-being of the parents and the family. So bringing those concerns, those challenges forward to your pediatrician or your other provider who's taking care of your children and maybe taking care of you forward to us so we can provide support and connect you to resources is critically important.
in this time more than ever. Um, so, you know, I hope that I've given you a little bit of a picture of what to look for um, in terms of symptoms that may be related to COVID-19. They're really common symptoms of things like the flu as well for children. When those symptoms should be cause for concern and should push you to go and seek medical attention immediately and when those symptoms might suggest, might be something that you could first talk over with your pediatrician and monitor at home. Um, I just want to continue to reiterate that the importance of vaccination for young children um, and how much we pride ourselves on continuing to provide access to those essential services for children. And uh, finally, that um, we encourage all parents to keep the lines of communication open with the pediatrician around how this is affecting your family as a whole um, and know that your pediatrician or the other you know, pediatric provider, clinician who's taking care of your children is likely still available through other means to address the other needs your children have. Um, other things that people may want to get into, but I wanted to leave space for Dr. Kronsberg to talk about the social, the emotional and psychological considerations right now, but other things that we may want to talk about if people have questions is what to do if you think your child may have mild symptoms related to COVID-19. I think we can talk in more detail about the importance of some of the social distancing and isolation measures that are being recommended. Um, but I'd really like to give Dr. Kronsberg the floor to talk more about um, these other important considerations in dealing with the stresses that are affecting all of us in these times and have particular implications for children's health and well-being. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thornton. I really appreciate uh, hearing your input from the, the pediatric side of things. And, and thank you to everyone for inviting me here today. Um, I just wanna start actually with an, an anecdote um, to kind of put the, the COVID uh, crisis in perspective from a child mental health point of view. Um, as soon as the social distancing measures were really put into place and we had to start reconfiguring how um, our own clinics were operating, a bunch of colleagues and I were involved in an email exchange where we were really wondering, you know, what's gonna be the best way for us to provide care for the kids that we're treating? And do we have to start adapting the kind of treatment that we are providing to fit this sort of, to fit what we know about providing mental health care in settings like natural disasters. And actually, um, someone who's an ex who uh, is an expert on providing that sort of care, who did a lot of research um, around Hurricane Katrina, chimed in and sort of helped us to understand this a little bit differently. And he had said, you know, this isn't the same sort of crisis as something like Hurricane Katrina was, where um, you had kids and parents um, in this sort of acutely life-threatening situation. Instead, this is really a slow burning and kind of gradually evolving medical and societal challenge. And, you know, we should really be thinking uh, a little bit differently, that this isn't the sort of situation where we're gonna see, you know, lots of incidences of like post-traumatic stress disorder or something along those lines. Um, but it is a really significant stressor on kids and on families. And so, you know, it is possible that we can see um, if causing uh, the emergence of new disorders, um, in particular depression and anxiety, and it can make existing depressive and anxiety disorders disorders a little bit worse. And basically the, the message was, you know, from a child mental health perspective, um, we should be thinking that, you know, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So um, there is some good news with that though. Um, and the first is that actually children's emotional and behavioral responses to stressful situations are often um, a lot less intense than we might anticipate. Kids are naturally really resilient in the face of stress. And actually there are lots of things that we can do to help them be able to tolerate the stressors better. And when I say resilience, that's what I mean. Um, helping uh, strengthen kids' capacity to handle uh, the stress of not only uh, the COVID situation, but also being in quarantine as well. So there's some things that we know about how to help kids be more resilient. Um, so for starters, social and community connectedness can really help protect kids from the sort of stress that they might experience during the quarantine. Um, so kids are uniquely able to maintain social relationships when there is physical distance. So I know we often think of uh, social media use as uh, something, oh boy, uh, you know, 
our kids are spending way, way too much time connecting with their friends, using social media, online, things like that. That's actually a strength right now for them, their capacity to maintain their friendships and their close relationships, even when they can't actually physically be around their friends. So that's actually really positive. Um, and the fact that schools are reopening in some capacity, you know, often uh, with virtual meetings with teachers, um, I think is also really helpful for them to maintain their sense of connectedness with others. And, um, and in particular, you know, we can make use of technology that exists right now to help families stay, stay in touch with one another. So again, we really want to, um, to the extent that we can maintain social relationships that we already have. Um, maybe the most important social relationships that we have right now um, that can help kids is within the family itself. And we know that family cohesiveness and, and positive relationships can really help kids tolerate stress. So there's some good news here too, um, uh, maybe too much good news in, in that we have so much time now in many cases to spend with our immediate families. So this is a great opportunity and it's one that we can put to good use. So I, I really highly recommend that families start um, making use of that time, uh, having things like game nights or movie nights within the family. Um, and family dinners are really great opportunities to do something like that. There's something online called the Family Dinner Project, which is a really great free resource for families that has everything from recipes that you can uh, use for dinner that, that puts your, um, your kids to, to help as well. And also, you know, conversation topics, something to get people's minds off of what's happening right now. Routines are also really, really essential, especially right now for kids' uh, mental health. The sleep-wake cycle especially is really important for making sure that kids' moods stay pretty stable. Um, it's really easy for the time that kids go to sleep and the time they wake up to really start to drift, uh, especially for kids who, who like playing video games and they like to play late at night. I'm really glad that school in some cases is coming back online because if kids have to check in with the teacher um, at nine o'clock or something along those lines, we know that they'll be awake and ready to start the day around those times. Maintaining a normal eating schedule is also gonna be really important. Uh, three meals a day. It's really easy to just sort of wander aimlessly through the house by the refrigerator, open it up, start snacking, go back to what you were doing, and then repeating this process over and over again. And finally, exercise is really important for kids' emotional health as well. I know um, exercise opportunities are fairly limited right now, but even just going on short walks with the entire family is something that um, can be really helpful. There are certain activities as well that can be helpful for kids' emotional health right now, in particular things that give them a sense of mastery. And by that, I mean helping them learn like a new skill or a new hobby where they can see themselves grow and progress. It gives them a little bit more of a sense of control of their own ability to, to you know, tolerate things and, and work through challenges. Um, and even things that are a little bit altruistic, maybe making masks for people without them is something that can help them feel like they're contributing to the effort. And then finally, um, mindfulness practice is something that can be really valuable. And mindfulness practice basically are meditative techniques that can help people stay focused in the moment and calm down their bodies and minds. There are lots of free resources online to help guide practice. Um, and you don't need to necessarily spend all day trying to engage in mindfulness meditation. You can imagine how difficult that would be to do with a, a five or six year old. Um, I do want to put a plug in for um, uh, one of my colleagues who's going to be joining this program in a couple of weeks named Netta Gould, who is our sort of mindfulness guru over at Hopkins. She's really, really wonderful, and I really highly recommend people tune in for that. I do want to mention that maybe the most important factor in how kids are going to respond to the stress of the COVID crisis is actually how parents respond to the stress of the COVID crisis. And that might be a little counterintuitive. And we know from research into kids weathering challenges like this that actually how parents handle the stress of a major event predicts how kids are going to do even better than how exposed to the event kids are. Um, this is sort of like being on an airplane when you hear the message that you have to put your oxygen mask on before you can assist your child. You know, we want to be the best parents that we can. And in order to do that, it's really helpful for us to really focus on managing our own anxiety. To manage our own anxiety, we also have to be aware of it. It can be really easy, uh, especially when we're stressed out about things, to assume that we're seeing anxiety in our kids when it's actually our own. And this is a common phenomenon um, that actually has its own sort of name in psychiatry called projection. It can happen sometimes when we're in situations where we ourselves feel helpless. So I really want to encourage you know, all parents, all caregivers right now to um, 
do the best that they can to also take care of themselves. And this is in some ways a really great opportunity for adults and parents to seek treatment for themselves if they feel like they're struggling. Um, there's a really common uh, form of treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy that's really effective in treating anxiety in particular. And it's treatment that can be administered over, you know, somewhere between maybe 10 sessions, maybe 12 sessions. And there are lots of uh, providers that are currently have moved a lot of their practice to doing things through video and with hours that are uh, wouldn't typically happen uh, in other situations. There are also some things that parents can do that can sometimes make stress a little bit worse for kids that's always worth just paying close attention to. Um, parents who show a lot of overprotectiveness with kids can actually increase the level of stress that kids experience. And that's the same thing for high levels of, of negativity and criticism that's expressed within the house. I do want to talk a little bit about just common responses uh, to kids who are experiencing the prolonged stress of something like the COVID crisis. These are common symptoms. This doesn't mean that a kid necessarily has an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder, but it's actually something that we'll often see in lots of kids. So really commonly, you can see mild disturbances in sleep and nightmares. You can see uh, somatic complaints. And that, that basically means uh, anxiety that's expressing itself sometimes through physical symptoms like headaches or stomach aches. And we can often see off also a small amount of social withdrawal as well. In really young kids, um, we're actually less likely to see these post-traumatic stress symptoms in really young kids. But you do see kids really mirror their parents in terms of their ability to, to manage the stress of, of this crisis. Um, younger kids in particular also don't often understand that sometimes things just happen by chance. So as parents, sometimes we may want to correct some mis misconceptions that they may have about why this sort of thing happened. Younger kids also are, are more likely to have those sorts of somatic complaints, the headaches, the stomach aches. In older adolescents, um, a, a sort of typical trait for a lot of adolescents is that they see themselves as being fairly invulnerable. And all of a sudden, this sort of crisis uh, can suddenly help them to, to realize that actually life is a lot more fragile than maybe they had realized. And that can lead to a couple of things. In some cases, uh, kids may wind up doing things that are a little bit more impulsive. Um, as a reaction to that feeling, and or the opposite can happen. Those, those kids may suddenly try to close themselves off from lots of different activities. And then school-age kids, and I'm talking about kindergarten through middle school, are somewhere in the middle. Uh, you can often see disturbances of sleep patterns and appetite changes, and, um, and some blending of the symptoms that you see in preschool kids and adolescents. Again, this doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything uh, disordered about the behavior, but actually something that we very commonly see in kids that are experiencing stress. However, a lot of parents are really curious about, well, what's a sign that my kid might actually need treatment or might benefit from treatment? And like I said before, um, anxiety and depression are the sorts of symptoms that we might be most likely to see under conditions of really prolonged stress. So one of the things that, that we always wonder about is, how are they functioning? Are they too anxious or depressed to engage in activities that they might otherwise enjoy or participate in? Are they you know, not spending time with family? Are they sometimes completely paralyzed by even the thought of leaving the house at all, so worried about the possibility of getting the illness or spreading the illness? And always, you know, anytime a kid thinks um, or has concerns about wanting to harm themselves is a time where we would wanna reach out and, and, and find treatment for, for our kid. Individuals that have the most amount of exposure to stress um, tend to be most affected by this. So that might be kids who have close family members that are affected by the illness or, or parents or other family members that are healthcare workers. They're probably experiencing a little bit more stress than, than they otherwise might. Also kids with pre-existing anxiety disorders or similar sorts of experiences to this, maybe kids that have lost a family member suddenly to illness before are at a higher risk for really, really experiencing um, more anxiety. Uh, so Dr. Thornton did a really nice job talking about uh, how we might want to share with kids. And I do want to talk a little bit about when the communication goes in the other direction and how we might want to uh, talk to 
kids when they're sharing with us. And there's really one principle that I think is especially important, really for all times, but especially times like these, which is we wanna validate our kids' feelings. So what validation means, it's communicating to our kid that we can recognize how they feel and that they have a right to feel that way. So whenever kids um, express their anxiety or sadness to us as parents, a lot of times we have this temptation to swoop right in and fix the situation, make the feeling go away because it's really, really hard for us to see our kids in distress. But a lot of times that actually can have the opposite effect. It can make the distress go up. Um, so what this means is we have to tolerate um, our kids being in distress a little bit in order to really be able to talk with them and sort of help them to feel seen. So for example, if, a, if, if one of our kids expresses real fears about the illness, even fears that, that may not be completely grounded in the facts about the illness, you can still validate the feeling. You can tell them that, that this is indeed a scary time and that it makes sense that they might be frightened. And at the same time, you can use that as an opportunity to correct some misperceptions about illness without telling them that they don't have a right to feel that way. There are also lots of other things that kids have, I think, a pretty good reason to be upset about. And, um, working with a number of uh, teenagers and, and high school seniors in particular, a lot of them have spent time sharing with me how upset they are to lose prom, uh, as, as an example, or lose graduation. And it's really tempting as a parent to say, you know, in the grand scheme of things, maybe canceling prom is, is the right move, and maybe it's not that big a deal right now. And so, that's an effort to try to help them to feel a little bit better, but oftentimes their immediate emotional response can, can just intensify. And the reality is prom is a big deal. And I think it's really important that we can, um, we can recognize that they have every right to feel upset under these circumstances. Um, so when we're listening to our kids communicate with us, helping to recognize that, you know, not only do we understand how they're feeling, um, but that, it makes sense that they would feel that way is going to be really important. So finally, one thing I just wanted to run through very, very quickly um, for we are spending a lot of time with our kids in many cases. They're not going to school. And so I just wanted to share a couple of tips for how to weather sheltering in place. So um, for starters, uh, establishing a regular routine, as I discussed before, is really, really important. We often wanna give kids choices, but we don't wanna give them so many choices that it, it kind of becomes overwhelming or that the choices all sort of blur together. It's a really great time to keep in touch with family and friends, especially using video chats. Um, we want to encourage our kids to choose something new to learn and, and to try to learn how to master. We want to help them stay physically active. We want them to participate in meal planning and help them really feel a part of the family. And just one piece of advice that I have for parents really all the time, but especially now, um, we often expect kids under stress um, to slide back a little bit in their development. And uh, so just a reminder for parents, we want to pick our battles with our kids um, and not uh, use and, and, and use this as an opportunity to be a little bit flexible in how we respond to them. So those those are those are sort of my my tips for what I think can be especially helpful for for managing the the COVID crisis with with your kids and with your family. And I turn it back over to our, our moderator. Questions. Um. So I'm going to start with Dr. Thornton, and I'm, going, I'm reading the questions that have come in from the audience, which um, thank you very much for sending those in. Uh, the first one would be uh, Dr. Thornton, when would it be safe to have surgery with a child that has complex medical history to reduce the risk of COVID-19? Well, that's a, a really great question. I, I will say I can... I can generally say in our system um, and based on our state's uh, response at the level of the governor, at this point, um, any non-emergent surgery um, is, is being, uh, so any elective procedures, rather, or surgeries are, are being canceled at the moment or postponed. Mm -hmm. But life is still happening. You know, babies are being born. You know, sadly, unfortunately, people are battling, you know, severe diseases like cancer. And um, the children may have, may need life-saving or life-prolonging surgeries or other interventions or treatments. And those things will continue um, and should continue. And I, I can say that 
Um, I, I believe this to be broadly true, but I can definitely say that I know within Johns Hopkins and the Johns Hopkins medicine system, those of us who take care of children are wholeheartedly committed to continuing to do so and to continuing to prioritize uh, optimizing their ability to be healthy. So I think that the question about a specific, for a specific child with a particular medical or surgical need is one that should be discussed in detail with the team caring for your child. And I'm, you know, I, I would defer to them on any specifics around the risks and the benefits and, and um, the timing. What I will say and what I can definitely say without equivocation in the Johns Hopkins system is that every necessary or every known precaution to minimize any risk of exposure for any child who is in need of care in our system to COVID-19 is going to be taken. And um, I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are a variety of challenges in, in ensuring that all the appropriate resources are available everywhere, um, but that um, healthcare providers, particularly in settings that are providing sort of um, specialized care uh, for children with significant, um, you know, potentially rare or complicated conditions are, are committed to ensuring that procedures that need to happen can happen in a safe way. Um, so I know that's not a direct answer as far as timing. I think the other part of this that is still evolving for all of us is the timing of, of, of our current um, response and mitigation measures to COVID-19. Um, you know, our, it's a rapidly evolving, changing landscape. And so I think it's about ensuring that the decision you make is made with the health of your child in mind in partnership with the medical and surgical team um, with the expertise to care for your child. And I, I wish um, you every, you know, sending positive um, and healing um, thoughts to your family. I know this, it, this circumstance makes those decisions even more difficult, but, um, but we continue to prioritize needed interventions for children um, that are, you know, are necessary for their for promoting their health and well being. Um, so, so I think that that you know it's a personal decision, but I, I just do want to be clear that um, precautions are being taken, that things that need to be done for children medically, surgically, um, that are urgent or emergent, are continuing to be done safely. We can't hear you. What to do about kids when, if they're acting out in mood swings? I'm sorry, would you mind just repeating that again from the very beginning? Yes. What would you, should, what would you suggest about kids who are acting out with mood swings? So that's, that's a really good question. And, and I think the biggest thing to get an understanding of is, um, you know, what's the source of, of the mood swing? So, so the first thing that I think we want to do is to try to provide an environment that's going to be as conducive to healthy emotion regulation as possible for kids. So the first thing we want to do is try to make sure that the environment that we're in right now, especially because the world feels so unpredictable, is as predictive is, is as predictable as possible. And so that means sort of the standard routine that you would try to keep as much as possible prior to this happening. Same wake up times, making sure that they're sleeping appropriately because we know those sorts of things can affect kids' ability to kind of uh, control and regulate their moods. Um, I also think especially now, clear and, uh, clear and natural consequences, and by natural consequences, I kind of mean reasonable consequences to uh, whatever the action that, that occurred was, and making sure that they're consistent. So the way that we respond to it is the same on Monday, as it is on Tuesday, as it is on Friday, as it is on Sunday. Um, and the more clear we are about expectations that we have in the house, the less likely we are to suddenly find ourselves in a conflict in the heat of the moment. So really the more kind of simple information that we can provide to kids um, 
in the beginning and in the middle of a conflict, I think the, the better and, and the easier it is to help um, uh, reduce how intense it can get. And then finally, I do want to just always go back to the idea of validating. So kids' mood can swing for all sorts of reasons. But if a kid expresses an emotion um, that makes sense, if they're upset about something like not being able to go outside and see their friends, um, that makes sense. And even though it's also understandable why that's something that we may not be able to permit at the moment, we do want to recognize that they have every reason to be upset under these circumstances. And if we feel, um, if we had any ability to make things different, we, we would. Thank you very much, Dr. Kronberg. Dr. Thornton, are children with asthma, diabetes, or an autoimmune disorder at greater risk and if so, how do I best protect them? Great. Um, so I can tell you what I am learning and what I think all of us are learning as more information is available. Um, so the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention puts out um, uh, epidemiologic reports on illness. And I believe last Friday put out a report specifically looking at complications and severity of illness from COVID-19 in children. Um, and there was an increased risk of hospitalization for children with at least one chronic condition. Um, that included things like heart disease, lung disease, including asthma. Um, and um, I think in general for children with autoimmune diseases who may in the treatment of those diseases be receiving medications that also uh, impact the functioning of their immune system. Um, those children in particular, I think we're, we're paying close attention to um, their risk of infection just because if their immune system is suppressed in the treatment of an autoimmune disease, it may also make them more susceptible to infection, infection in general. Um, so I think that while we do know that there does seem to be in the United States some information that, that these children may be at more risk of hospitalization, I, I think that the picture continues to evolve and I would really um, you know, defer to colleagues who are completely focused in the realm of infectious diseases and epidemiology as we continue to learn more. Um, I would say that for the most part, similar practices in terms of looking for signs and symptoms would apply to any child. And I, and I, I just wanna reiterate again that in our training, for those of us who are clinicians who primarily take care of children or entirely take care of children, we honor and we respect and we partner with parents. And so I think that parents who know their child, know what illness uh, looks like in your child, um, may know what respiratory distress looks like in your child, may know uh, specifically how um, the difference between a fever that's, you know, a fever but probably getting better and a child with a fever who's really not themselves. We want you to reach out to us and call us and talk that through with a, with a pediatric provider clinician who really, who knows your child's uh, specific medical context. Um, but like I said, I think that there is um, at least the, the report um, from Friday's um, MMWR from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, did identify chronic diseases as a potential contributor to hospitalization. Um, Again, I do want to emphasize that compared to what we know about the severity of illness and the um, mortality of illness in adults, um, the risks of, of, of severe illness and mortality in children are less, but that doesn't, you know, when it's your child and you're concerned, um, I want to validate that and I want to encourage you to reach out um, to talk that over with a clinician who knows your family or like I said, if your child has severe symptoms to seek urgent medical attention. Thank you very much. Dr. Konsberg, is this the right time to switch antidepressants in children or adolescents? 
So I think a lot of it would depend on the, the guidance that you might be getting from whoever's doing the prescribing. Um, in many cases, psychiatrists are prescribing antidepressants, but in, in many other cases, pediatricians are as well. Um, I can't speak to any one individual specific circumstances, um, but I do think when it comes to thinking about making a change in medication, it's worth wondering to what extent are these new circumstances really driving the, the picture? Um, are we seeing a kid reacting to a schedule that is dramatically changed or um, expectations of the home that are suddenly very, very different from what it is that they're used to? Um, and so at least, Personally, I would say my philosophy overall is to kind of give kids a chance to really adjust to the new reality. Um, however, I think that's a really personal conversation uh, that's really worth having if you feel like the medication that, that your child is taking really isn't working in the same way that it used to. Um, I think that conversation is worth having with, with the person that, that's prescribing that with you. Dr. Thornton, so a two-part question for uh, women who are pregnant or just had a child. What precautions um, are the maternity wards taking to prevent COVID for mother and baby? And also, is it safe to breastfeed? Great. Well, this is an actively evolving um, landscape in the context of the care of pregnant women, I can say um, that there are, you know, different systems are approaching this differently um, and that we continue to learn more and more. Um, I believe that there have been some reports that um, women who are pregnant can, can be infected with coronavirus and not have symptoms in pregnancy. And so, um, I, my recollection is that some of that has come has been information that's come out of New York, and um, as a result, I think that there are a variety of approaches being taken. I think people, particularly in our system, are um, following the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and the expertise of the epidemiologists and infection control experts in our system. Um, I know that within our system. Very recently, we've begun testing all women who are coming in in labor, um, both because of the, you know, as a practice to really minimize the risk of transmission of COVID-19 to healthcare workers in that context, and also to keep women who are laboring in the safest circumstances possible uh, for them. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of a focus on infect, preventing infection and spread of infection, what we call nosocomial infection in the context of hospitalization. Um, and that particular attention has been paid to pregnancy and, and delivery. Um, with respect to breastfeeding, so I think there's a variety of questions and I don't wanna get into a lot of hypotheticals for any one's individual case, um, but I can say that the, um, Again, healthychildren.org is a great source of information for parents on this topic. Um, but that in general, um, my understanding is that breastfeeding and breast milk, in particular breast milk, uh, can, can still be safely given to infants if a woman herself is infected with COVID-19. I think similar to the recommendations around distancing from people who are symptomatic or have infection, um, there is a lot of, of challenging conversations around what happens if a woman herself um, is found to have, be, have COVID-19 in the context of delivering her infant and, um, and how to manage you know, keeping her safe from transmitting COVID-19 to her child. Um, so there are some elements of that that are personal to personal decisions and decisions that should be made in consultation with your um, your OBGYN providers and pediatric providers and your family and take into account family circumstances. And there may be specific guidelines or practices in the hospital where a woman is delivering that will, um, will mean that certain practices have to be followed in that setting. Um, and I think all of these practices are intended 
to prioritize the health and the well being of moms and of babies. Um, so this is this is rapidly changing, but we're we're definitely prioritizing that I think in our system, and I think um, clearly you know every every where where women are giving birth, I think the priority priority is keeping them safe from infection transmission within the healthcare context and in ensuring their ability to you know to keep their babies safe. Um, so. But, but the question of breast milk, I think, is, is a question that we've talked about a lot and that there is a fair amount of information to suggest that even if a woman is infected, her breast milk um, can still be safely given to her infant. Um, so hopefully that's responsive to the question. But Kelly, if I left anything out, please chime in and I'll, I'll circle back on it. Great information. Great information. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. Dr. Kronzberg. Are there resources for teens out there for anxiety? And in particular, um, teens who, like you've mentioned earlier, who you know, are missing their proms and so forth, and also going off to college and um, the things that they're missing on that. Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and I would say, so there are definitely resources that, that are available. Some of the things that I had mentioned already, like mindfulness practice, which is anything that's in, in many cases suitable for adults to try is also going to be suitable for teenagers as well. Um, for kids whose anxiety feels not manageable, um, there are all sorts of things to try anywhere from you know, workbooks that are rooted in the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, which I described. But this also might be a really good opportunity for, um, for kids and teenagers to consider getting engaged in, in therapy right now as well. Um, and then finally, the thing that I would just keep saying again and again and again and again is uh, for kids and teenagers, especially that are struggling with anxiety. So mindfulness practice is really helpful for helping them to stay in the present, but also maintaining consistent schedule um, and a consistency within their day and making their day feel predictable can reduce their overall kind of level of anxiety that they might be carrying around with them throughout the day. And then finally, just one, one other thing that I would, I would wanna add is just be mindful of what sort of media your kids might be consuming. For kids that are just watching the news and just getting the same messages again and again and again and again, and because they're having a hard time turning it off, we may need to be a little bit more firm with kids under those circumstances. At a certain point, more information is not helpful for, for anyone kids and adults. So we, we just want to be mindful of, of what our intake is. Thank you, Dr. Kronzberg. Thank you very much. Dr. Thornton, for children, um, for social distancing, do you feel that there should be strict guidelines when they're playing with their friends? And the next part of that question is, and should they be wearing masks, children? So, um, I'm also a mom. It's possible you hear one of my children upstairs not super happy at the moment. So I, 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 I can empathize and sympathize with all the parents and caregivers out there who want to um, maintain fun experiences for their children and that connectedness. I would say our, our sort of our, our, our best recommendation is as much as possible um to to practice the physical distancing even with children and friends um so you know for younger children it's it's impossible really to kind of keep them six feet apart and with their friends in any kind of relational setting because that's just not something they can really grasp and um operationalize and stick to um and so i think that in the in the most like strictest sense of the word i think that we're 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 sort of encouraging families to consider um doing more kind of virtual uh play dates and interactions for kids um and 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 trying to minimize those opportunities for uh um transmitting germs um you know i think as far as wearing masks with friends um you know, I, I would I would point you to the the CDC guidelines that suggest that in in public, um, when there's a chance that we could be within six feet of others. So I'm thinking about settings, not like taking a hike in the woods with your immediate family, but in settings where you may be 
in a grocery store or in a, in a space that's shared and you can't always control distance. The CDC is recommending the use of masks. Um, the healthychildren.org website has really good information, I think, in general for toddlers and young toddlers uh, and infants. Um, we would have concerns about um, suffocation risks, strangulation risks, and so generally the AAP's guidance, the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance is no masking for children under age two. And I think we also have to be cognizant of you know, being able to ensure that um, children are able to breathe and, and that having a mask on doesn't um, sort of push them to touch their face actually more than they otherwise would. That kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so as with many of the guidelines right now, I think it's a combination of doing our best to do our part as much as possible. Um, with implementing physical distancing and uh, trying to stay at home as much as possible um, within our immediate kind of household at the same time that we have to um, manage um, manage life and and so I, I think that that's a balance that is personal to families and to circumstances um, but I hope that this guidance is generally helpful helpful to you in thinking that through. Um, you know, it's amazing what kids can do together by FaceTime um, and the, the new fun adventures they can have um, through sometimes having virtual contact, even when they're, they're young. Um, so I would encourage you to think about those in addition to kind of doing, if it's older children or children who you think can kind of maintain distance um, to really be cognizant of, of those recommendations. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. Dr. Kronsberg, what insights do you have on long-term impact on kids, especially being in quarantine for so long? So I think that's a really good question. And to some extent, it's worth kind of recognizing that this is fairly unprecedented. Um, certainly since we've really um, refined a lot of like research techniques and things like that, I don't know that we've had in this country an event that's quite like this before. Um, when I think about things that, uh, when I think about how I see there being some long-term impact for kids, um, one thing that I think is um, worth acknowledging is, as, as we had already mentioned, there are going to be a lot of kids who've missed milestones and who uh, derive a lot of comfort and enjoyment out of doing certain things in certain types of the year that, that are likely going to miss that. So that's anything from graduating from one grade to the next and getting the opportunity to say goodbye to teachers and in some cases friends. Um, uh, that's something that, that they're going to miss and it's going to make those transitions a little bit harder for kids. So I think we're going to have to be really creative to come up with ways for kids to be able to do things like say goodbye to friends, say goodbye to um, uh, really beloved teachers to um, experience uh, special milestones in a somewhat different way. And I think schools are, are working really hard to be as creative as possible in, in helping kids kind of feel connected to one another um, and to come up with, you know, some sort of virtual alternative to things that, that they might have been looking forward to for the entire year. Um, you know, I also think that um, this may, in some cases, make certain things like flu season be a little bit scarier for kids. They might be worried, oh, is this going to get really bad? Are we going to be right back in the same situation that, that we were in before? And I think kind of anticipating that sort of worry and being able to address that sort of worry with kids is, is going to be really important in the future as well. And Kelly, if I could just add, in addition to the long-term emotional consequences, there are a lot of families who are already, um, maybe were before this, or will be, depending on how long this goes on, experience financial hardships that in and of themselves affect those uh, families' abilities to meet basic needs of children that we consider as pediatric clinicians, sort of the building blocks, the necessary preconditions for children's health. Dr. Kronzberg mentioned things like family meals and access to healthy food and safe spaces to play. And I, I just want to lift up the fact that I think every pediatrician thinks about these necessary preconditions, like a safe place, pl enough food to eat, a developmentally appropriate setting, as things every ch child needs. 
and that we should be doing our best to support every parent or caregiver to be able to provide. And so um, I encourage people not to, you know, feel shame in sharing those challenges with pediatricians. We know many, you know, young parents are also in the essential workforce and uh, in jobs that have little glory and not that much pay. And so, um, so we're here to help give voice to those challenges and help support families through these really difficult times, emotionally and you know, financially and everything else. Looks like we've run out of time. And I want to thank our doctors, Thornton and Kronsberg for their expertise and time this evening. Really, really appreciate it. Wonderful information. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Please tune in next Tuesday, April 21st at 7 p.m. When, when we will be discussing a COVID-19 update with Dr. Lisa Maragakis, an, epidemiolo an epidemiologist, excuse me, and Senior Director of Infection Prevention right here on Johns Hopkins, A Woman's Journey webcast. Good night and stay well.